Okay, uh, I apologize for the sound not working. Uh, I am going to record this again for you. Um, and it'll be better this time because I've already practiced it one time. <laughs> and so we have talked a lot about cells and a lot about organelles and the way that cells work. And we are now going to move on to the topic of histology and tissues. We're going to put the cells together into bigger pieces and we'll refer back to the cellular function and cellular structure in a lot of ways. And so if there is material that you really don't feel like you understood from before, uh, you do want to review it and feel more comfortable and maybe some of the things that we talk about will help reinforce the topics uh, that we've already started off with. All right, and so here I have the learning objectives. And so essentially, if you can go through and do uh, these things, then you uh, have completed what you need to complete for the material. And I have it continued because we're throwing in not only uh, just regular tissue, we're also throwing in um, specifics about epithelial tissue and the connective tissue. All right, so what is histology? Uh, histology is the study of tissues, which are a collection of cells and an extracellular matrix, which is essentially the fancy word for the stuff between the cells. And the study of how those cells and extracellular matrix is arranged into organs. So in, in gross anatomy, you can see structures with the unaided eye. Here you can see lungs inside a thorax a thorax, thoracic cavity. Here you have the mediastinum in the center that has the um, pericardial sac. And here you can see a heart removed. So these are gross structures. And then histology is if you actually looked at the cells and the fibers uh, and the components of the tissue up close using a microscope. Why is it important? Well, you really have to see the tissue up close with a microscope if you want to look for um, clinical situations like disease, uh, if you want to look for bacteria or viruses to tell whether someone has an infection. You can look at the cells to see if the tissue has a tumor, cancer, um, if it's been infarcted, which means if the tissue has had a blockage in its blood supply. You can also see changes in the cells that give you an indication on whether or not they're working properly or whether they're dysfunctional. And sometimes you can see evidence of genetic abnormalities. So these are all reasons why you might want to look at an organ closer, look at the histology. So what specifically and structurally is a tissue? A tissue is just a general word that is going to um, refer to uh, cells that um, are going to be included in this structure and in extracellular matrix or fibers that are going to be between the cells. And so here you can see the tissue here that has most of the cells highlighted in yellow and that these cells are closely packed. We're going to get to what kind that of cells these are. But then you also see in between the yellow that there's kind of an amorphous pink sort of uh, mass that mixes uh, between these bunches of cells. And so there's a lot of fibers. There are some cells, but there are a lot of fibers in this um, area. And so the collection of cells and fibers that are united in a common purpose is, is what a tissue is. So histology really can um, involve cell biology, some physiology, um, as well as some biochemistry. And so we don't normally only talk about a structure and say how tall it is or how wide and what it's made up of. We also talk about the function of those structures at least a little bit so that um, you can have a reference for why the structures are important. It's very hard to learn um, the structure without understanding some of its function. And so there's a lot of overlap in the discipline of histology. But essentially, the underlying foundation is that the basic elements of a tissue has cells. Uh, usually the cells have a purple 
bluish purple nucleus in them that you can see, and then extracellular matrix or fibers and um, ground substance that exists between the cells, and we'll talk about, about those as well. So a cell is going to be that individual unit of life that we talked about that has those specific organelles and it has a plasma membrane. And then the extracellular matrix is the, the essentially anything that is between cells. So it has a lot of different types of molecules in it. Um, and very importantly, it has fibers and fluid, a lot of which is water. Now the element, the basic um, element or description of an organ is that an organ is a structure that has multiple tissues in it. So more than one tissue is going to come together to make an organ. So on this slide, this is actually a section through the trachea. You can see one tissue highlighted here in yellow. We have another tissue type that's right uh, deep to that. We have another tissue type that's deep to that, and then we have yet. Uh, one or rather two more. And so all of these tissues that are uh, layered in this organ are going to come together to make a trachea, which that organ within itself has a ultimate purpose or function. How do we study tissues? We usually study tissues uh, with a microscope that you can see here. And I mean, uh, usually uh, an example, um, as an example, because Clinicians who would remove tissue from patients and look at the tissue to see if there is disease present is going to usually use a microscope when they do that. Now, uh, the microscope uses slides, and we prepared some slides last time. That was that was uh, fun. You're going to make more, and they're going to be probably a little nicer uh, as we get further along in the course. But. Um, we don't usually use microscopes in teaching histology, uh, at least we don't use it as much anymore, um, but rather we use virtual, virtual slides to look at um, histology, and this allows us to look at many, many slides um, in a short amount of time. It also is more environmentally um, sound because you're not uh, constantly um, replacing the glass and the chemicals are very caustic and also the dyes are not always very environmentally friendly. So for teaching purposes, if you have a good slide, you can scan the slide using a high resolution scanner and then share it with other people. And so for teaching purpose purposes, we oftentimes use virtual slides. So a little bit about how the slides are made. I think that this helps you put uh, it into perspective and understand what you're looking at in the end. Um, we take the tissue, uh, just like we did last time, um, from an organ, and then we're going to put it through a serial um, sequence of solutions that allow us to eventually end up with a microscope slide. So the first process is fixation. This is when we put the tissue that is fresh, just out of, out of the body, into a solution that is going to cross-link proteins. And it's also going to kill any pathogens that are in the tissue. And this allows the tissue to uh, stay um, in its original condition for a long period of time. Uh, it also hardens the tissue a little bit, uh, which, which will make it easier to handle and cut. Well, that's a little bit more of a, of a um, deterrent from fixation than it is a benefit at this point. But this is the first step. After we fix the tissue, the tissue is then put through a serial sequence of solutions that will remove all of the water and remove all of the lipid out of the tissue. And the very last step, we put it in uh, paraffin wax so that all of the spaces that had water and lipid are going to um, be replaced with paraffin wax. And this allows us to have the tissue suspended in wax so that when we put it on uh, the knife and cut it, it hardens the tissue and the tissue doesn't get distorted like it did when we were cutting it uh, last time. So after you have your paraffin block, you can see the paraffin block here um, on this uh, piece of equipment. It is going to be sectioned with this type of a piece of equipment, which is called a microtome. And so this uh, results in a long ribbon of uh, paraffin wax tissue cuts that allows you to then put it on a microscope slide. 
And then the last process is staining. And we did some staining. We just we just dipped uh, we just put drops on the slide. But what you can do is do a whole bunch of slides at one time and put uh, them in s sequence of solutions, alcohol, and also dyes to um, stain the the cells on the slide. And this is what the slides would look like if we didn't stain them. You just you can see some texture, but you're not going to see this, the differentiation in the structures like you would when we stain. And so um, the most common stains are what we call semi-selective. So they're selecting structures that are acidic or basic, but they're not really going in and just selecting one thing and, and dyeing it a certain color. We do have selective stains so that you can just really pick out one thing that you want to stain in the slide, but most of the time we use this self-selective. So the first thing that we put first stain that the slide goes into, if you remember, is going to be a stain called hematoxylin, uh, and it's going to, so, going to stain everything that is basophilic in the tissue. And then the next stain that you put it in is eosin, and eosin is going to stain everything that is acidophilic in the tissue. And then you end up having a slide that has all of the structures that are basophilic and eosinophilic stained either blue-purple or uh, pink, and that's what we look at under the microscope. And this is the most common stain, staining method. So the basophilic tissues that stain with hematoxylin, there are other stains that do that. You don't need to know this, this list. Um, but this is going to stain nucleic acids, glycosaminoglycans, and acid glycoproteins. So we call it basophilic because it's um, basic loving, because the structures are acidic. And then um, hematoxylin, I mean, eosin is going to be acidophilic and is going to stain tissues that are uh, more basic, like mitochondria, secretory granules, and the protein collagen. And so that is going to be uh, the eosin, and we have other ones here, but you don't need to know those. And so the most staining procedure is called NH and E, hematoxylin and eosin. So now you kind of understand how a regular slide is made. We also have another very popular uh, technique, which is um, oftentimes shown in teaching and, and in clinical work, and that's uh, electron microscopy. The other type of uh, slide, this um, regular kind of slide, we use on a regular microscope like you have in lab, and this is called light microscopy because light is going to shine through the slide and it's going to give you something to look at. But in electron microscopy, electrons are actually uh, pointed through a beam through the tissue, and it can either go through the tissue and it can... Um, end up on a receptor on the other side of the tissue to be received and it can make a picture that looks like this. This is called transmission electron microscopy. And so um, the electron beams have just gone right through the tissue to a receptor that's on the other side uh, and receiver and then it makes this picture because where, where the electron beams didn't go through, okay, you have more dark in the picture and where a lot of electron beams went through because they didn't hit any organs or I'm mean, sorry organelles you have it lighter and that makes this uh, gray tone image that you see here. The other type of electron microscopy is called scanning electron microscopy and this is when you have um, very small metal atoms that are painted on the surface of a slot of a tissue and then the electron beam is pointed at the surface and it re bounces off and it is sensed by a receptor and a receiver. And that receiver is going to uh, then make this picture that looks like a 3D picture. So it's like bouncing off the top. So if you were to um, have something that was very textured and then you paint it over it, you're still going to see that texture and that's what's happening here. And that's called, this is called scanning electron microscopy. And then I wanted to talk to you about artifacts. So when you're looking at a slide, you're going to see a lot of stuff that shows up and it looks very noticeable as if it was um, a pathology or something that was happening in the tissue or maybe it looks like a very important structure. But unfortunately, it's just a um, 
it's usually just a tear or a bubble or space um, that happened because of the uh, process of making the slide and it's not really what the tissue looked like before the slide was made and common artifacts is the tissue shrinking like you can see a lot of white space here that looks like there was no tissue there but that's not true the tissue just shrank when it was processed you can have wrinkles where you have uh, flaps of tissue that folded over other places this is a big tear a big rip or um, tear that happened when uh, the slide was made so that was not there before life I mean before the tissue was before the animal or the person um, passed away and the tissue the section was made and so I also want to point out that when you're looking at a slide this is more like what you're looking at so if you see this uh, tube here let's just pretend like this is a blood vessel running through tissue and you can see that it is uh, weaving up and down and turning in all different configurations but when you cut the tissue to make a slide you're only cutting through like a section like this um, part of the figure is showing you so when you look at the section what you end up seeing are all these different size um, and configurations of this tube in different places it doesn't really give you a pic full picture of what's up here or what's down here and you have to keep that in mind not only when you're looking at histology slides but also when you're looking at medical images so the big picture is that there are four basic tissue types in the body. Each tissue type has its own characteristics and it has its own specialized cells that make that tissue type unique. And so the cells and the characteristics that are in one of these categories do not go into another one. We don't have any overlap. So it's either epithelial, connective, muscle, or nervous tissue and the cells that belong to these different tissues do not mix so it's not like you have a cell that can be one category and another epithelial tissue is a very diverse group of tissue it has a lot of different kinds of cells that have specialized functions and there are two main types is uh, one is called surface epithelium and the other is called solid epithelium. It can also be called glandular epithelium. Surface epithelium can also be called a membrane. Um, I don't like the term membrane as much because it can get confused with a lot of other um, parts of the body where you talk about membranes, but they're, they're really not um, referring to the histologic term term membrane so here um, here you can see the surface epithelium and this is a solid epithelium now what makes these cells unique is that uh, they they all are doing um, one job okay and I'll get to that in a second the surface epithelium is going to separate a compartment so it's going to line the surface of the body or line cavities in the body so it's going to actually have uh, be a barrier between two compartments. They do a lot of interacting with both sides of the barrier to decide what's going to come through the barrier. So when you're looking at um, a slide, it can be overwhelming and it does just look like there's a crazy whole bunch of, of cells smashed in there. But I want you to... Um, really just start thinking about tissues on a, on a bigger scale. So this is a gut a tube. So if you had the tube of the gut and you were just cutting through a little tiny side of it, this is exactly what it would look like here. Okay. So if I take that and I can actually zoom into that part, so if I look at the inside of the gut that would be up here on the slide, I can see that there is an epithelium that's lining the gut. This epithelium is deciding, the surface epithelium, what is going to come through this barrier and make it to the other side, which is here because there are a lot of blood vessels here and the blood vessels are going to lead to this person's vascular system. So this, these epithelial cells are united in the function of deciding what is going to pass through it to make it to this underlying um, space that has blood vessels. And then if you look at the other side of the gut tube, which is uh, depicted down here, you can see that there is another very thin sheet of cells 
And these cells are also deciding what is going to come through this barrier, but it just it doesn't have as many cells because um, it's not quite as uh, common to have a whole bunch of material that's out here and that needs to come through or, or likewise on the, in the other direction. So it just has a very thin layer of cells. And so these epithelial cells exist anytime you have um, two compartments where a decision needs to be made what passes between them. So some of the uh, epithelium are very well suited to be uh, protective, like this skin is very protective. It's really thick and they have special characteristics to allow for a lot of friction to occur without damage. Some of the epithelial um, cells, though, are united in the function of absorption and uh, secretion. So deciding what is going to pass through the barrier of these tubules, for example, this is the kidney. And so the epithelial cells are have special characteristics that allow them to uh, absorb uh, molecules really rapidly and um, comprehensively. And then some epithelial cells, especially the surface epithelial cells as well, are um, specialized to secrete products. So they either secrete um, proteins or they secrete gland products. Uh, here these cells are in the colon and they're secreting mucin to make uh, mucus on the surface of this colon. And then yet other epithelial cells have the function of playing a major role in special senses. So these epithelial cells have specialized um, extensions, right, that stick up. We talked about um, some of these apical extensions, cilia and microvilia last class, microvilli. And they allow for uh, one type of energy, whether it be chemical or mechanical, to be changed into an action potential that your brain can understand. So in this case, it's the ear, the inner ear, and the fluid that moves in your inner ear moves these hair cells around and causes stimulation of nerve endings that tell your brain that those hair cells are moving. And that's how you hear, and it's also part of your vestibular function. And so all surface epithelial cells form a continuous sheet. So they're all connected to each other. That means that they have a lot of junctions that are between the cells. And we talked about junctions in the last block. And if you didn't learn that material, you want to uh, revisit it so that you can understand its importance because the epithelial cells really, really use a lot of junctions so that they can stay one continuous sheet. So the cells are bound to each other. And another characteristic is that underneath the epithelium, there's always a structure called a basement membrane, which is um, supporting connective tissue underneath, which we'll talk about next. And the supporting connective tissue is responsible for getting all of the metabolites to the cells and all of the waste products away from the cells. And it's also um, has a lot of links in it, a lot of junctions that allow the epithelium to stay adhered to the rest of the organ, no matter what the organ is. So some terms uh, that we'll be using throughout our discussion of histology is that um, the, the, these cells are referred to as being polarized, but it's not polarized in an ionic way. It's polarized because the domain that's at one part of the cell is distinctly different from another. And so the apical surface of the, of the cell is towards the lumen. So you can see this lumen here. Uh, the, whatever is on the inside of, of the tube or the organ. And then the basal part of the cell is going to be towards the underlying connective tissue or that basement membrane underneath. So we call that the basal surface. And those, those sides of the cell have different roles. And uh, one defining um, characteristics of epithelium, almost exclusive in the body, that they do not have blood vessels in them. So although they have very tightly packed cells, there are no blood vessels that run up into any epithelial tissue 
with the exception of one in the ear, which you um, we may discuss, but not we're not going to really I'm not going to hold you to it. And so all of the metabolites, all of the waste products have to diffuse to through the epithelium by crossing connective tissue. Now, we talked about this information. I just wanted to reiterate it because here is where it becomes important. The uh, junctions that we talked about, the tight junctions, the spot desmosomes, belt desmosomes, and gap junctions are all existing in these epithelial sheets. Some of the epithelium has uh, those special um, specializations on the apical part like cilia and microvilli, we talked about those. I didn't really put the flagellum here because it's only on the sperm cell, it's not on any other cell in the body. And then the basement membrane um, and the basal part of the epithelial cells has its own types of junctions that we don't, we didn't really talk about and it's not necessary, but there's also um, the basement membrane. So I just put errors in so you could see where the, the different uh, parts of the cell and what was and highlighted where they're located at. And this was a picture almost similar to what we used in the last block where it shows you the different regions for those different uh, junctions. You don't, you don't need to know those for this test, but the last one is cumulative. And so uh, I also have pictures here of different types of those specializations. Now that we're going to start looking at slides, you can see cilia are long hair-like projections that stick out from the top of the of the cell, apical part of the cells. And I want you, when you hear cilia, I want you to think movement, that they are motile, they are moving, they are beating because they're made of microtubules that are ATP dependent for motion. And that's in contrast to microvilli. This dark purple line here is the line of microvilli. The, the proteins sticking off the top are just stuck on there. You can't see individual microvilli but um, they all show up collectively as this dark line that we call the brush border. And so microvilli very specifically are um, used for absorption. So when you have an area of the body where there's a lot of absorption, there's going to be a lot of microvilli. And then the last one is stereocilia, which happens in the male reproductive system. And you don't have to know that in this class, but I felt very funny about taking it out as if it didn't exist. They're just very, very long microvilli. So here I put a couple of informational slides in because I realized that you don't have, you all don't have a textbook that has um, necessarily good information, all, all the good information in it. And I've kind of uh, deviated a little bit this time. Uh, and I wanted to remind you about how, my, how microvilli do not have microtubules. They are not energy dependent. They do not move uh, except for to sway along a little bit with the fluid, but rather they're made of actin filaments, which were that um, uh, microfilaments that we talked about um, being inside the cell. And then cilia, I have um, just a little, little blurb here on the cilia to remind you. All right, so most of the time what people talk about when they jump to on epithelium is just what kind of epithelium is this? Well, um, I, I like to give you a little bit of context first which so that with my long-winded explanation. Uh, but generally now we can talk about uh, what kind of epithelium there is because you're going to be looking at it. You're going to be needing to classify epithelium. So there's two, uh, there's two kind of types that... Um, we have major types, something that's a covering epithelium for protection, and then we have epithelium that's secretory or secreting a product. And we're going to define them by uh, the number of cells that are in the layer of epithelium, the, the cell shape that they have, and any special features that those cells have. So uh, the easiest kind of epithelium is simple epithelium. So that means there's only one layer. And if you only have one layer, those types of epithelium are good for absorption and secretion. So having things cross from one side to another, that's, that's what you really want simple epithelium for. So it's simple, it only has one layer, it's great for uh, absorption secretion but really bad for protection so this is what we need for protection we need a lot of layers so we also are going to name them by their their shape the shape so if they're tall uh, we're gonna call them columnar if they're flat like these flat cells on the inside of this blood vessel we're gonna call it um, squamous 
And the reason why they would be taller is because you need to fit a whole bunch of organelles in these cells so they can do their cellular work. And um, that's why they end up being bigger. And these flat cells are, are also perfect for their job because things are gonna diffuse, like water um, and oxygen are gonna diffuse through the cells, so we need them to be a thin barrier. So here we have the different types for the simple. We have a simple columnar. Here we have simple columnar that has cilia, so that's why it's simple columnar ciliated. We have a simple cuboidal, and here we have a simple squamous. Every blood vessel on the inside has a layer of simple squamous epithelium, and that has a special name that's called endothelium. And then we have stratified epithelium. Stratified has two or more layers. And so here you can see uh, this is, has a whole bunch of layers. Down here, this is supporting connective tissue. And here we have the epithelial sheet that has a whole bunch of layers depending on where in the body you're look, looking at. Generally, it's for more protection. So we don't normally have absorption or secretion occurring between these layers because it's very difficult for them to cross. Here you have stratified squamous, which means we have more layers, but the top layer is thin and stretched out. So we call that stratified squamous. Here we have stratified epithelium. There's two layers, but they're not flat. They are cuboidal shape. So we call them stratified cuboidal, and that's very rare. It really only happens in the salivary glands. And then here we have a special kind of stratified epithelium in the bladder and the urinary system that we call transitional or urinary because it has lots of cells, but the top layer of cells isn't flat, it's a dome shaped. And that's the hallmark of that kind of epithelium. The intermediate filament, I know we talked about intermediate filaments as one of the three kinds of filaments inside cells in the last block. And I want to point out that the type of intermediate filament that are in all epithelial cells is called keratin. And keratin is important uh, for uh, maintaining shape of the cell, so it's very important for the cytoskeleton. It also is important for making junctions between cells. So it's, it's uh, a great um, intermediate filament for epithelium. And here you can see the keratin um, that has uh, that are in these cells actually fill up and completely take over these cells in this stratified epithelium. Um, and these cells here still have nuclei at the top layer. You can still see the nuclei, so they're not filled up completely of, of keratin like these are. So how we differentiate between these two types of epithelium is that this is stratified squamous, it's flat at the top. This is stratified and squamous. But this is non-keratinized because the cells did not fill up with keratin, but this example is keratinized because all of these cells are all filled up and there's no nuclei left like there are down here. So this is stratified squamous non-keratinized, stratified squamous keratinized. So this is one example of what, how reason why keratin is so important. And then um, epithelium can also make glands. So they're not only covering, uh, covering epithelium, they also make up whole organs that are glands. And these are two examples, a, sal a salivary gland here and a thyroid gland. And glands can be two different kinds. They could be exocrine, which means that these cells make a, sec a secretory product. They make a product and they get secreted into ducts and then they open up on top of another epithelial sheet or they open into somewhere, usually into the mouth or into the gut or onto the surface of the skin, like in an example of a sweat gland. And then these glands over here um, is an example of an endocrine gland where the product is made by these cells, the, all these little cells, the product is made here, it's stored, and then as it's released, it's released into the bloodstream so that it can travel to its target organs and have an effect. So that is called an endocrine gland. So an exocrine gland opens up, uh, it secretes the product, it goes into a duct, and it opens on top of another epithelial sheet, and a other kind of gland called endocrine is going to secrete its product into the bloodstream. Um, and that 
a gland usually has uh, a product, a, a portion that is going to secrete the product, and then it has a duct that goes somewhere. So if you're looking at a, a gland uh, like that, or here's a, a gastric gland in the stomach, it has a part that's secreting and then um, it's going to open onto the surface of the stomach here. And, and glands can also be what's called unicellular. So this is one cell, but it's a gland. It's secreting a product that goes on top of this epithelial sheet. And we call these special cells goblet cells. Uh, you don't have to know that right the second, but um, I think I think they're adorable and uh, they're really just they're fun bubble cells that are, exist in many many places in the body. Okay, and so I made these labs for you. Uh, they have a bunch of structures here that you can uh, go through and try to find. Um, the lab uh, has slides that you can click on, and it will take you to a location and. It also gives you examples so that you can see uh, examples of all of the different structures that you want to look at. Okay, um, And then when you click on the slide, it will take you to a virtual slide where you can zoom in and zoom out and you can look at different kinds of epithelium. So these are all surface epithelium. They're just tubes that are cut in different ways. And you can see that they're one layer and they're cuboidal in shape. So this is a simple cuboidal epithelium. If I went to this blood vessel, I can see that this has simple squamous epithelium. So it's kind of a cute, uh, I like the simple squamous epithelium. It's also called endothelium. So those are the two um, there. Let me see if I have, I do. And then you also on this uh, slide can see this epithelium. It has lots of cells and the top cells are dome shaped. So this is transitional or urinary epithelium. This is one of the, uh, that has transitional or urinary. And so you can kind of go around the slide and find all three of those kinds of epithelium. And then a fourth one here, which is simple but columnar. So we have simple columnar. We have urinary. We have simple cuboidal, lots of places. And then if you find a blood vessel somewhere, Try to find red blood cells. And red blood cells. This is simple squamous here. Okay, so play around with the lab. We will have time. Every every time we'll have labs where you can look at stuff and ask questions. Uh, and so I hope this was informative.